riot. You, uh, you still smart? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all relative. It, all, it is all relative. I, uh, uh, I thought when, when, when we started this process, as, as we showed in the movie, the, what I first thought was he was bullshit. But then, the minute I met him, I knew he was just genuine. And, uh, uh, and then getting to know him more and more, it was just constantly confirmed that he was genuine in his, in his process. And uh, I, I predicted to Ryan Moore, one of the producers on the film, I told him, I said, he's going to come out as um, a humanist agnostic. And I was really proud that he, that you included the word atheist when you described what you would become at that point. Has any of that shifted since that point in time to now? Or is yeah. that still accurate to what you think? No, it's still accurate. I mean, I think I'm like more sure that there's no God than that last clip. Like I'm, um, or, or I'm, I'm more sure that there's no way to know. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's just—it's not like a—it's not a question that can be, um, like, interrogated with any sort of like. There's no tools with which to, uh, you know, gain access to that. So um, I don't feel to me to me, atheism is a kind of question that you can answer in like a second, yes or no. Right. You know, and it's and so as a result of that, it's important, but it's not that important. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's. It's, I wouldn't. I, I don't feel compelled to build my life around the idea of being an atheist yeah. because it's one tiny question that has almost no bearing on. Like there are as many there are, there are atheists who have as a, a range of convictions and beliefs about everything else in the world. Right. You know, there's no like it doesn't predict for anything. You know what I mean? Being an atheist doesn't predict for. I mean, you can meet racist atheists. You can meet. Um, Rathiest. Rathiest. <laughs> you can meet, you know, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, you know, Socialists, you know, you know Anarchists, whatever. Like, it, 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 atheism doesn't really predict for being a good parent, it doesn't predict for being a good partner, it doesn't, you know, so I don't, it's, it's important as far as it goes because I think it does teach one some tools, intellectual tools for, um, Approaching the rest of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't make you suddenly like a rational person. Right. Uh, or it doesn't suddenly make you like a, a moral or ethical person. So it's interesting, and I, it's funny because the way I was able to be a pastor for so long is that I, I never really approached the question of God's existence directly. I always was, I was always interested in the ways in which religious belief work in the world and what they're good for and not good for. Um, so this was oddly enough the first time I had ever really taken time to turn my attention inward on the question of God's existence because my whole life and my whole like academic life had been focused on um, religion almost as a sociological phenomenon in the world and how it functioned in the world for good or for evil. So um, so I, I mean I think my, my, my statement stands like I feel um, a little bit more, a little less agnostic about the question. Right. Um, but yeah, pretty much the same. Uh, cool. Um, there's no idea which you can arrive at which will now like foreclose on the need to keep thinking. Right. right. Like you just have to, which is why I think the, um, the impulses of communities like this, uh, where we're gathered today and others around the country, are, are really important, you know, to um, to focus on especially making public policy around things that we can be reasonably sure of, um, and uh, and really and really putting you know some attention on that. Right, right, right. Uh, Want to go to questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever. Does anybody have any questions? All right, let me go on. Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> so Ryan. What precisely is this God that you don't believe in anymore? Um, 
what was it when you did believe? I mean, I sit here watching this film, and everybody's talking about God, and nobody's defining their term. I don't even know if all of you were talking about the same thing when you were talking about God. There's, there's no definition of God offered. So I don't even know if you knew what you were talking about, and if you, when you talked to somebody else, if you were talking about the same thing. What is this thing? Uh, uh, you used to do this every day. I mean, for 19 years. Yeah, I mean, it's a little different context now, but I, I think part of the problem, and I don't know if you're being leading or if you're sincerely asking me, um, I'll assume that you're sincerely asking me. Um, I mean, I think this is part of the problem is that there's no way to know what, every, like, what each individual person is talking about when they invoke uh, the word God. So, I mean, for me, it, it meant um, God, God was the creator, the inspirer of the Bible, um, sort of the prime mover throughout history, the person who's keeping um, everything on course, uh, uh, revealed God's self to the prophets who wrote things down. I don't know. I mean, I could go on for days about that. The same God that filled the uh, pyramids with grain. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. It's the, it's so, the great. I, I think it's. I mean, the Abrahamic, the Abrahamic God, the Allah, Yahweh, yeah, Jesus. Is, is that coherent? Well, no. now he knows it's God. You saw the end of the movie, right? <laughs> so I no, I, I I think I think the answer to that question is this man went through a significant journey. It was more than a year, but he went through a journey. Um, that brought him to exactly where you're sitting and, uh, and realizing that it isn't coherent. And it, because it's co not coherent, that's why he's sitting here right now talking to us about his journey. I mean, I think if you, took, if you take any sort of physical object and you place it on the, on the table and you say, what is this? Is it A or is it B? And we can say, well, it's clearly not A. You know what I mean? You can analyze it and talk about it in that way. One of the reasons that religious conversations are so difficult is that it's, it's like trying to put your finger on like mercury or something. It's like it just keeps moving. No matter where you push on it, it becomes something else. Right. And so you can't really say, um, well, Christians believe that you should stone disobedient children, right? Yeah. Because that's in the Bible. Well, I've never met a single Christian who thinks you should stone disobedient children, but it's in the Bible, you know, so is that God? I mean, it's just, this is how the conversation goes, as you well know. Like, it's just, the minute you push on something controversial, it shifts. Well, a lot of people think that that meant to stone them, throw rocks at them, but they, they do it now with drugs. They stone them, and so that's what it means then. Really? Of course. Margaret Hi, Ryan. Hi. Um, what can we as atheists um, do to really outreach and um, not convince uh, the Christians to not believe in God, but to outreach to them? What can we best say and present ourselves uh, as a community besides offering a free toaster? <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, the thing I, I can only tell you what I've found. Um, the most recent um, episode of my podcast, it's like I, just didn't, I didn't start this as a pitch, but um, is with uh, Andy Stanley, who's the pastor of the largest congregation in the United States in Atlanta, Georgia. There's like six or seven campuses and that kind of thing. And my orientation to the world is that of someone uh, who is curious. To me, the most baffling character trait that I encounter in other people is this incurious yeah. approach to the world. Like, a person who just doesn't have any questions about anything. I, just, I don't understand that. Like, I don't understand how you wouldn't wonder about everything, <laughs> right? So, when I approach a Christian, it's not as an apologist who's trying to convince them of something, but as someone who tries to be genuinely curious about how did you get there? Um, or when I hear someone tell me something about their political ideology. You know, my first question is, who told you that? Like, how did you, like, did you read a book that, and then you just believe that? Or if I showed you another book that said something different, would you change your mind? 
Like, how did you arrive at that decision that you um, that you've made or that idea that you hold? And so, you know, when I was talking to Andy, I just and I just asked him, "What's that like to to be a part of an organization that um, routinely excoriates you for suggesting, as he recently did, that maybe the virgin birth wasn't that important to the Christian narrative?" And people almost literally with pitchforks came out to like, tell him that he was going to go to hell. And I just am like, yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> right? I mean, he was texting me and he sent me a video, of the, you know, and I was just like, uh, yeah. Right? What's that like? You know, uh, how are you feeling about that? I mean, I just, for me, it's trying to connect with people at their level and allow them to express, I mean, if any good journalist who's interviewing a source wants to make them feel comfortable, so they'll say things that five minutes after they stop talking to you, they'll wish they hadn't said. Because they're like, oh shit, what are they gonna say? What are they gonna put that in print now, you know? Um, the most terrifying conversations I've ever had with journalists have been times where I thought, oh, I just trusted that guy with some really important information. I hope they don't screw me over. And. And I think there's times like that where I'll get off the phone with someone and they'll think, hey, you know, there are about 30,000 people that depend on me as a pastor. Just let's be careful with that information. So I think people have to trust you. They have to know that you care about them as a person, not just as an ideology. And I find that conversations open up like that. People are willing to say what they doubt. People are willing to say, the, you know, what they're not sure about or the nagging suspicions that they have in the back of their mind about, or even just to say that you can't know. I mean, to get, I think to get a Christian to admit that the things that they put a lot of faith in they don't know for sure, that's huge. Like, I don't, I used to say to, you know, as a Christian, like, my goal was not to convert people, it was to help people to um, grapple with the questions that they have about their, their life and the world and to find peace and happiness, and I feel like that's still, for me, um, my main motivation, and we want the same thing in the end, I think, and just to help people to, to get there. We have time for one more, I believe, actually. Let me see here. I want to be fair. Years ago, there was a 
you know, a person, a historian, or a political figure, or something that you hold in high regard, but their view of like uh, gays and lesbians wasn't so favorable. But then again, 100 years ago, so was everybody, you know? So it was like, well, you can kind of realize that they're kind of in that place. And I think, you know, part of the way I understand Jesus is that he was, if he existed as a real person, of course I have to say that in this group, um, uh, and I think it is likely that he was a composite character and highly morphed into a narrative, right? But um, I, I think if you see him in his cultural context, he was a um, first century Palestinian in a Jewish religious context. He was not like a historical, a contextual. He was his responses to questions would be those that you would expect of any rabbi of the time. And he uh, probably looked a lot more like Bin Laden than the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just say. Yeah. So I, I, I think I can. I have an appreciation for him the way I would, or or the, or this, the narrative of him, right? Um, that I would have of any historical character who has contextual issues with things that we come to know now that maybe they didn't have the background for. Does that make sense? Uh, and uh, uh, there, there are a number of people you recognize. Uh, 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 Eugenie Scott. I don't know if she's in the room. Mm -hmm. Eugenie here. Well, she's she's yeah, there she is. Eugenie Scott. Right there. She's the one that convinced them not to be an ardent atheist like me, but to be a humanist. <laughs> Can I, I, gotta, I gotta say one other thing. Everywhere I, hi Eugenie, everywhere I go and I talk about this, I and I think about Tam, you're the first person, I'm not making this up because she's the only one from that group in the room. Yeah. You're the first person I think of and I always have this, um, I'm gonna sound like an evangelical now, I have this like warm like memory of our conversation that was just so meaningful to me. So anyway, you have a special place in my heart. Thank Eugenie's you. Back. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for the email.